Hello and a warm welcome to Portfolio Watch. I'm Kukule Tunfupi and tonight we're discussing investing in quality stocks. Now adopting Warren Buffett's mantra is that it is better to buy a high quality company at a fair value than a poor quality at an attractive price. This has been very much in vogue, especially since the global financial crisis. But what every investor prizes is steady, predictable growth and companies that strive to deliver this. But simply put, one would agree that a company that can deliver profitable and sustainable growth would be considered as a high quality company. Yet some myths have been busted. For example, the more globalized, the higher the quality. And big is high quality and small is low quality, among others. So what really constitutes a high quality company and a good investment choice to make? That's what we'll answer this evening with my guests in studio, Andrew Ditburner, Chief Investment Officer for Private Client Securities at Old Mutual Wealth, and Nick Norman-Smith, Chief Investment Officer at Lentis Asset Management. Gentlemen, good to have you with us and thanks for joining us. Let's actually start just there. What is a definition of a high quality company? <laughs> yeah, so I think it's something that's very difficult to articulate if you speak to investors and you know, if you, if you look back, I suppose, in the 2000s, everyone spoke about value. Value investing was very much the yeah. thing to be doing then. And since the global financial crisis, value has, you know, kind of been parked to one side. And now everyone talks about investing in high-quality businesses. But when you actually say to someone, you know, how do you define a high-quality business? Very often, as you suggested in, in the introduction, that people think big companies are, are high-quality companies because they have to be high-quality to, to become big. But they forget that maybe they've been helped along the way. You know, maybe there's industry effects uh, or, or competition you know, um, dynamics that might have helped them get to, to where they've got and they're not necessarily big companies. So I think to, I mean, high quality companies rather. So I think to, you know, really try and define what a high quality company is, you can come at it from a number of angles. You suggest, you know, you want predictable, steady earnings growth. Sure. And I think absolutely, if a company can do that over a sustained period of time, I think we could, we could classify them as, as a high quality business. But there are other things we need to look at as well. Mm. You know, are those earnings backed by cash flow or are they accounting earnings? Um, you know, is, is, is one example, for instance. You can then also look at the balance sheet to get a sense of, of how stressed the business is. You know, so there's a number of, I suppose, angles that you could come at it to, to put your finger on, you know, whether this would be a high quality company or not. We'll interrogate those in just a moment, but mm. Nick, from your perspective, what are some of your uh, uh, views on uh, high quality companies yeah. and just exactly how to identify them? I would say kind of two broad factors. One is so, uh, a business that's earning power or earnings are protected from competition, the competitive moat that Warren Buffett always talks about. So there are a number of different categories that can protect you from regulation to brands to scale um, and, we can, and we can go into them. And the other is the ability to reinvest capital at a higher return on capital. Mm. So if you've got lots of opportunities to continue reinvesting capital and earn higher returns on that incremental capital, then that's a, that's a really high quality business. If you can get both of those together, um, fantastic. But as always, as a value investor, you need to pay the right price for it. Um, and I think, I think a lot of us, speak, speak for myself certainly, have learned a lot in the last 10 years about quality and how sometimes you do need to pay up slightly for it. I do think we've moved all the way along though. Value investing is really out of vogue. Sure. And quality investing is really important. And I think people are starting to make the, the mistake of paying anything for quality. And we've seen many, <laughs> many, um, Examples of this in the past um, the, that has led, uh, you know, ended in tears. Give so. us some examples here. Uh, Andrew, you, you, you also uh, <laughs> smirked at that particular expression because it's something that has happened. And of course, as investors, we tend to uh, hog on to the trendy sectors and trendy mm. industries, which actually see us uh, regarding them as actually being high quality stocks or high quality sectors. Some uh, yeah. pitfalls to avoid here? Yeah, so I think you, you misinterpret sometimes quality, you know, and you just get you know, sucked into the idea that this is a great business and you can take, you know, you alluded to them, some of these tech companies yep. in particular, you know, and then suddenly you forget about the valuations as Nick suggests and you just, you know, as these stocks go high and higher, you get caught up in this momentum type, you know, trading in environment and you, you ask for examples, I think a very recent example would be a Netflix, for, for instance. He has a yes. company that everyone talks about, you know, the disruption, you know, capabilities, you know, of Netflix, how it's going to disrupt cable, it's, et cetera, what's going on in that whole media space. And what happens is people, you know, rush to it, buy it, push it up onto, onto you know, valuations that might, 
you know, is talking to you know some value investor <laughs> or value investor on, on my right. Uh, you know, you might say that you, those valuations are unwarranted for a business like that. And what happens the minute it disappoints, you see the share price come off materially. Mm. And it's price for perfection, and we saw that last week with Netflix. Yeah. You know, when Netflix re released their results, their subscriber numbers came in, I think, about a million uh, odd subscribers short of what the market expected. And I think the share was off about 13%. This is what happens when you, when you misinterpret quality, uh, you know, for the next, uh, the next big, big thing, thing, and you don't care about valuations, and you just pay up for anything. Okay. Quality is important. But I agree with Nick that value valuation is equally important. And let's look back at history because time, time will tell on Netflix. I mean, I'm, I agree with Andrew, but, but who knows, maybe you're wrong. But let's look back to the early 2000s and say, okay, what were the real quality companies then? Cisco produces all the plumbing for the internet. Intel produces the, the memory chips. Microsoft produces the software and Oracle runs all the databases. Okay. Mm. The world is moving forward. We're all going to, um, the, the internet's going to explode and whoever's well placed is going to make a lot of money. You were 100% correct if you predicted that in the early 2000s. But quality companies like Microsoft were trading at 45, 50 times earnings. Now those businesses have tripled, quadrupled, um, and now even more their earnings. But it took you 10 to 12 years to break even on investments during that time period. So you picked the ultimate quality companies with the ultimate sectoral tailwinds and you still lost a lot of money. Sure. And when was the time for value investors to buy it? Was you could buy those stocks a few years ago when they were out of favor and they've doubled, tripled. Sure. So value still, you know, price, price still does count. Price still does count and that raises some critical elements as to how best to identify these particular sectors. But how many of these um, sectors or quality companies are actually driven by fundamental macroeconomic dynamics? We've touched on the tech sector quite extensively and of course we know that economic growth, um, uh, job creation potential aren't necessarily fundamentals that drive or contribute um, to these particular sectors. Should we be looking outside the tech sector perhaps at all? Yeah, so I don't think industry necessarily determines whether you know, a company is a high quality business or not. So mm -hmm. I think we most definitely should be looking outside of the tech sector if, if you're looking for high quality businesses. And in fact, you should be looking across every single industry. Okay, because so the little gems everywhere. You know, if you go and look back, Reed McGrath did a study, I think it was in about 2010, and she looked back at companies that were able to grow earnings on a sustainable basis over five and ten years. And when she identified those companies, which were a very, very small amount, and this is looking across the world, I think about 3% of companies could do it over a 10-year period on a sustainable basis. And when she looked what those companies had in common, they didn't come from a specific industry. They weren't either big companies or small companies. They weren't globalized companies. You know, what they had in, in common rather was, Nick touched on it earlier, is capital allocation. Yeah. CEOs that were able to allocate capital effectively and get, you know, and, and generate those returns on that capital above the cost of capital. They are agile businesses that, you know, that are able to move quickly, spot new, uh, you know, new revenue streams and, and move very quickly into those. And they're, and they're also abs absorptive. So they've got strong balance sheets um, that can see them through difficult times. And now we can think of a number of industries in South Africa in particular that have gone through very difficult times. And immediately what comes to mind is a couple of high quality businesses. Mm -hmm. So knowing how to identify them quite accordingly. Very quickly on the capital allocation, with a lot of companies we're really seeing uh, strong cash flows uh, coming through from the entities. And of course, some of us like this because you expect the dividend, but others want that capital allocation. Can that differ as well when it comes to various um, quality stocks that you identify in the market? Yeah, and again, it, de it depends on the opportunity. So you can have sure. a, a high quality business with very few additional investment opportunities. For a business like that, you either want the cash paid out or if the stock is trading at fair or below fair value, you want management to buy back as much stock as you possibly can. So, you know, people call these kind of cannibal companies. And, and, and some of the best capital allocators are businesses that are just shrinking the shares in issue every time. So if I don't have anything better to do, but I can buy my shares back at a very cheap price, fantastic. Unfortunately, look at the resource sector as a great example. Mm. Management tend to buy back shares at the top and issue shares at the bottom. So there's, there's not that many <laughs> management teams that are able to do it. <laughs> but those that can are smart. Look at, look at PSG, issuing equity when their share price is expensive. That's a smart thing to do. That, that's good capital allocation. Of course, you'd rather grow and, and expand the company, but sometimes they're just not the opportunities at that point in time. Exactly. I think just to add to that, I mean, I saw a graph in recent weeks that showed share buybacks in the US. You know, and suddenly all of these companies, we know what's happening there with 
you know, the, the tax, if you can call it tax reform, suddenly they, they cash flush and these companies are buying back, you know, their shares in, in the dozens, Jeez. you know. <laughs> and maybe, you know, when we look back in five years' time, we might say exactly what the resource companies did. These guys bought back shares at exactly the wrong time. And mm -hmm. this is where the capital allocation uh, decision comes into it. You know, if the shares are expensive, which I think the argument today is that global markets and US in particular, not necessarily, you know, bubble territory, but it's fairly lofty valuations. Maybe now is not the time to be buying back a lot of these shares and rather returning the cash to shareholders if you cannot find a, a uh, you know, suitable investment idea. Makes a lot of sense. I'll tell you who can change that though, Trump with the tweet. <laughs> but on that note, let's get into a perspective now with regard to uh, the equities environment and uh, nitpicking at some of the stocks that we need to consider that are actually great quality companies. Let's get into the first company now, and the one that we first will have on our list is Wilson Bailey Homes. Now, I'm a little bit skeptical, given what we've seen happening in South Africa's construction industry. Is there still hope here? I don't think construction, quality in the same sentence very often. Andrew? <laughs> no, I don't think you, you would typically talk about construction and, uh, and quality, except I think when it comes to one share in, in that sector, and that's Wilson Bailey Homes. So if you think back now to you know, the valuation arg argument again, and you go back to 2007 in the lead up to the Soccer World Cup, you know, everyone was willing to pay, you know, multiples of in excess of 20 times for mm -hmm. these construction companies. Now, if you want to look at does big equal high quality, if you go back then, which were the big construction companies? Murray and Roberts and, and Avenge, you know, are you going to say now, sit here now and say what's happened over the past 10 years that you would consider those to be high quality businesses? Probably not. Sure. Um, but if you look at Wilson Valley Homes, you know, he has a business that I think has a management team that's done a superb job. If you think about capital allocation, I recall in the late 2000s, people talking about Wilson Bailey Homes and saying they're stingy, they've got way too much uh, cash on their balance sheet, it's a lazy balance sheet, they should be returning this cash to shareholders. But when times got tough, that balance sheet, you know, saw them through, through the, uh, the tough times. Their tendering process and the execution on jobs is, is far better or far superior than what we've seen also in, in the industry. And as a result, you know, he has a company that over the last 10 years has, has you know, doubled its share price where what's happened to the rest of the industry. Mm. <laughs> quite true, quite true. Yeah. Nick, you agree with that one on uh, WBA? Yeah, I, I think the industry, and, um, you know, sometimes as Andrew was saying, you know, some industries aren't necessarily uh, good for quality companies or bad for quality companies. I'd say generally construction is, is quite a bad industry. It's got relatively low barriers mm -hmm. to entry. Um, when there's a lot of competition, people will charge flat or negative margins just to keep going. And that's what we've seen in our industry. And that's why it's taken so long for it to, to turn around. So I would say, I'm not sure if it's a quality company. I think it's a quality management team. Ah. Um, so I guess you've got to make the call. How much do you back <laughs> the management team? Obviously, you'd rather have the high quality business with a high quality management team. We had Microsoft high quality business, mm -hmm. low quality management team with Steve Ballmer. Look what happened when Satya Nadella came in. He's turned that business around and showing its true potential. So I think it's a very tough business to be in, but there are times in the cycle where these businesses are attractively valued. And, and if you look at the competitive environment now, companies are going out of business um, left and right. So that, that's a decent time to, to be in, in that industry, absolutely. Mm -hmm. You can be the last man standing and, and, um, and generate value. But yeah, very tough business to be. So I, I'd sure. probably say quality management team versus quality company. Fantastic. If you can separate the two. Before <laughs> <laughs> if we can separate the two. Before we do go to an ad break, I want to throw Comair in there. It's been one of those mm. classic companies which continues to remain resilient. It's uh, profit per passengers has come under slight pressure. Mm. But um, I think for a listed airline a company, managing to keep its head above water for some time. Yeah, so I mean, if you look back, you know, Comair, I think, was founded in like the late 40s. And I think it's been profitable every single year. Um, you know, earnings haven't necessarily gone forward every single yeah. year, but I think this is the one airline in the world that over this time period has been profitable. You know, uh, typically people would say, you know, how do you make a small fortune, invest a large fortune in, 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 airline? A, in an airline? Warren Buffett, you know, now suddenly owns, I think, pretty much all of the US American airlines, always got stakes in all of them. If you look at Comair, you know, what drives Comair's bottom line earnings, or if you think of an airline, you know, it's oil price and it's ex exchange rate. Mm -hmm. You know, so here again, I would disagree with Nick when you talk about quality management teams and quality companies. Maybe you talk about a difficult industry and you've got a quality management team that, that you know, results in a very high quality business. Here's a difficult industry that's oil and exchange rate 
driven. But what has Comair done? They've diversified their earnings. They've put their low-cost carrier in. They've got a training uh, business. They've got a catering business. They've sure. got their slow lounges. So here they've diversified their revenue streams as well. So showing the ability to be agile, showing you know, uh, management's ability to allocate capital effectively. Smart management team, yeah. but my only concern is that the share price isn't reflecting that growth though, right? So it's very much, you know, as I say, driven by, uh, by uh, oil. So when oil goes up, you know, obviously their main input cost is, is uh, fuel for, for, for the airplane. So you would expect the share price to come down. So it's come from what, 650 to five, uh, 650 cents or 650 to, to five rand. But if you look what it did over the last three years, you know, it went from one rand to six rand. <laughs> exactly. So I don't think we need to look at share prices okay. to try and determine whether a business is a high quality business or not. Fantastic. Yeah. Nick, you have any thoughts on uh, Comair very briefly? Yeah, interesting, the industry structure. So the industry structure here is, is a lot yeah. tougher because you've mm. got non-economic participants in SAA coming in. They're not really too worried about profits given that they're losing so many billions. So they're gonna cut, uh, cut their fares relatively low it's relatively easy to launch a new airline. You can hire some planes, and we've seen a couple come in and, and go out of business. Um, in, in, interesting America. So that industry's changed quite a bit. So it was in the same sort of situation when there were lots of national carriers around. A lot of those national carriers have now gone away. The industry is now competing on a more rational, competitive footing. And what you've got is the existing carriers own, own slots, and those slots are very valuable. In other words, the good times and the good places to land your planes and fly them off. So it's actually become a kind of oligopoly um, situation with 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 the U.S. and I think that's why people like Buffett are now looking again and investing in that industry. So yeah, I guess probably the same comment before. Tough tough industry, mm -hmm. but I mean, the numbers are there, right? They've they, exactly. they've run the business very very well. So clearly, choose the uh, last man standing and the one entity that actually looks like it can remain resilient with discard uh, regardless of uh, the uh, market conditions that they face. We're going to take a quick ad break, but of course, you can continue to join the conversation by tweeting at CNBC Africa using the hashtag Portfolio Watch or email us your questions to portfoliowatch at abn360.com as our panel would be delighted to answer them and of course hear your thoughts on investment insights. We'll be back right after this. Welcome back. You're also watching Portfolio Watch. Tonight we're discussing investment in quality stocks. My guests still join me in studio, Andrew Ditburner, Chief Investment Officer for Private Client Securities at Old Mutual Wealth, and Nick Norman-Smith, Chief Investment Officer at Lentis Asset Management. Now, just before the ad break, we had touched on a variety of stocks in Wilson, Bailey, Homes, and Comair. Clearly, the uh, differentiated stocks uh, within the uh, difficult industries that they operate in. But looking abroad now and at uh, stocks that are allocated mm -hmm. offshore, Medtronic is also one of those that comes up. And this one is well known for the innovation that they actually come up with within the medical spaces globally. Yeah, so, you know, this is one company that um, private client securities holds in their global equity portfolio. Sure. We really like th the idea, you know, Medtronic, as you s suggest, is a very innovative business. They, they uh, supply medical devices. They operate essentially in four different segments, you know, cardiovascular, uh, orthopedic, diabetic, and now they've, they've gone into this minimal invasive technologies through their acquisition of Covidian about, I think it was about three or four years ago now. And that's proven to be a, a, a very good acquisition. So talking to capital allocation, if you think about moats or economic moats that Nick touched on earlier, you know, these guys, I would, I would argue, have a very wide moat. You know, they've got strong relationships with uh, physicians, hospitals, cl um, clinics, etc. And mm -hmm. it's very difficult, you know, to start switching between medical devices, you know, s specifically when you're dealing with cardiovascular and spinal medical devices. Sure. So they've got entrenched relationships with those doctors and it's, you know, the switching costs, I would argue, would be quite high. Um, from a competition point of view, competition is, you know, there's only about three or four companies globally that, that essentially play in that direct space. And then if you go and look back, I mean, going back to 19, you know, the <coughs> early 1980s, this company has grown revenue every single year, year on year, except for one year, I think it was about 84 or 85, somewhere around there. Mm -hmm. You know, that talks, you know, to a company that can sustainably drive their top line. And if you look at their dividends, they've increased dividends every single year from 1983, I, th I think it is. Sure. So if you're going to talk about a dividend aristocrat, you know, this is, this is it. So I think, uh, you know, this is a great example of a very high quality business with a wide economic moat. 
sounds like it has all the features that we like and of course ride spang bang in the middle of uh, the innovative cycle and one another mm -hmm. another company that actually deals with innovation that we often don't think about in that light is rolls royce right because mm -hmm. uh, when we think that we think luxury cars and brands and of course we think about um uh, the fantastic individuals who are able to afford them why is this one that uh, a quality stock that we should potentially consider nick so this is this is actually rolls royce holdings so this is the engine makers so they split out bmw now actually owns the car brand oh. so that these the the prime business is making engines for what they call um, wide body airplanes so basically airplanes with two aisles there's only two manufacturers in the world that that make these now um, general electric and and rolls royce rolls royce has gone from a 16 percent market share and according to the order books which are quite long given how long it takes to make an airplane they're going to be up at 50 percent in the next few years that's huge that's massive so very little competition it's very difficult to compete because A, you need to invest a lot in designing a new engine. You need to sell a lot of those to amortize the costs. Um, no one's willing to do that. You have to eat the losses on that for a number of years. This is a razor, razor blade model. So they actually lose money with every engine that they sell mm. and they make money off service contracts for the next, next 20 to 25 years. So when you buy the engine, you sign up and Rolls Royce look after it. So it makes sense for the airline, their interests are aligned, but these contracts are, are very lucrative. Now what's happening at the moment is the business is losing, or it's not losing money, but it's not making as much as one would think because it's moving that market share from 16% to 50%. So it's selling a lot of razors at the moment and it's gonna harvest a lot of razor blades out into the future. And if you look at the competitive position, there's two, as I said, there's, there's only two companies, there's unlikely to be anyone new. Do you really wanna change your, uh, your engine manufacturer mm. given, uh, given how important it is? It, it's quite similar to a Medtronic actually. This is the proportion of the engine cost is relatively small in the proportion to the airline and the, and the whole operating costs. Sure. But it's rather important. That's the kind of thing you want to be selling, just like a heart stand. It's mm -hmm. not that expensive in comparison to how much you're spending on the heart operation and the care. But if that goes wrong, you're in, you're in serious trouble. So fantastic com competitive dynamics. The airline industry is growing at um, around 4-5% or at least every year and is, and is probably going to increase. So it's a great industry to be in. It's just a case of where in the value chain do you want to be? And we like the area where there's virtually no competition. Almost sounds like mm. there's a value proposition here as well for the long term, as you mentioned. Uh, but of course, that also speaks about the share price. Uh, uh, what are we seeing with regard to that at the moment? Does it look fairly expensive? It, it, has, it has rallied quite a lot because the business was under serious pressure a while ago. Mm. Um, it, it's kind of tailed off a little bit because it had some issues with some new engines that it's, um, that it's um, put out there and it's going to cost them a bit to fix it. So as always, it, it doesn't come without risks. But we still think the market's not appreciating uh, just how strong that earnings power is mm -hmm. over time and just how much of a return on in incremental capital they're going to be able to uh, make over the next five to ten years when they continue to grow those, those engines. Yeah. Mm. We've touched on a lot of uh, sexy, innovative industries, but mm. what about good old-fashioned fast food? And <laughs> Domino's Pizza, I understand, is on the list and features here. For many of us as South Africans, fairly new to the South African market, given that it was brought in uh, by uh, one of the local investment mm. companies. But I understand uh, from the uh, New York Stock Exchange, this actually might be regarded as a quality stock. <laughs> Pizza and quality, another two uh, sentences that yeah. never, never, and I, I would never put together. So when you think of Domino's locally, Taste Holdings, I think, br yes. brought it in, you know, a few years ago. And I don't think it, uh, you would, as you say, you wouldn't think of it as a high quality business. But if I had to say to you now, again, I said earlier, don't look at the share price to determine whether it's quality. But if I had to say, you know, between your FANG stocks, your Facebooks, Amazon, Apples, Netflix, Googles, etc., throw in Tesla there since 2010, what shares performed the best between them and Domino's Pizza? you'd be surprised to learn that Domino's Pizza's outperformed all of them. Wow. And how they've done this, they've done it through innovation. So we think of it as a, a, as a pizza company, it's actually a tech business. You know, and they've got their roots back to, I think about the 1950s or 40s, somewhere around there. And only in 2010, a new CEO came in, realized that the product was actually poor. So he invested capital in you know, reinvigor or, or, or um, re reinvesting in, into the product, putting out a brand new pizza that didn't taste like cardboard. <laughs> um, and they had the, the um, you know, delivery and within 30 minutes, that was their guarantee, realized that this was putting people in harm's way. They had a lot of you know, delivery guys that had uh, motor vehicle accidents. So what are they doing? They, they throw out the 30 minute guarantee and at the same time they start looking at autonomous vehicles, motorbikes to deliver pizzas, uh, you know, with drones in the future, drivers, drones is, is another one exactly. And you can sit on the train in the US and order Domino's pizza and collect it and get it delivered to your seat at the next stop, for instance. Wow. You, can del you can order your pizzas through your phone with zero clicks. So it's a very innovative, agile business. 
you know, that has changed with the times as it's realized it had to, which I think talks to, to the management team. Mm -hmm. Is this one that you're considering, Nick? Uh, and it does, do you actually hold no, it? No, so at Private sure. Client Securities, no, we, we don't own it. Um, but it's just a, you know, very interesting, you know, an old sort of industry that you wouldn't think is being in innovative. But these guys have changed the way that fast food is now ordered. Exactly. No more yeah. cardboard pizzas for you, Nick. <laughs> no, but, uh, you know, we talk about returns on capital. A franchise-based business is obviously a massively high return on capital business. So if you can get it right, you can see that's why they've been so successful. It doesn't cost a lot for them to expand. And that's the same as a tech business. It doesn't cost a lot to sell another piece of uh, software. Unfortunately, I think because that anecdote is now out there and we've seen the share price rallying, it's now mm. trading at 50 times earnings or something ah. like that. So yeah. who knows, maybe they'll grant it, but probably, probably looking a bit expensive, but really interesting story. Sure. Interesting dynamics that we certainly discussed today. Pizza, construction, as well as uh, medical and uh, technology. But uh, of course, uh, reminding us that we do need to look at the uh, finer details in order to identify quality stocks. A big thank you to both my guests for joining me this e evening. Andrew Ditburner, Chief Investment Officer for Private Client Securities at Old Mutual Wealth, and Nick Norman-Smith, Chief Investment Officer at Lentis Asset Management. Do be sure to join us again next week at the same time to get uh, more investment feedback. And of course, feel free to join our conversation on social media at CNBC Africa using the hashtag Portfolio Watch or email your questions to PortfolioWatch at abn360.com. Until next week, have a good evening.